Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Mostly Harmless by Douglas Adams. So this is book number five in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy. Um, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... 30 years of celebrating the comic genius of Douglas Adams. Arthur Dent hasn't had a day as bad as this since the Earth was blown up. Depressed and alone, Arthur finally settles on the small planet Lamuella and becomes a sandwich maker. Looking forward to a quiet life, his plans are thrown awry by the unexpected arrival of his daughter. There's nothing worse than a frustrated teenager with a copy of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in their hands. When she runs away, Arthur goes after her, determined to save her from the horrors of the universe. After all, he's encountered most of them before. So, let's go ahead and get started. I will say I read some negative reviews of this on uh, Goodreads. I didn't mean to. I normally try not to read reviews before I read the book. But um, basically what happened was like when I went to add it to my wish to want to read list on Goodreads or whatever, um, I happened to just see some of these negative reviews. Um, but I did not believe them. So anyway... So uh, it points out that at the end of this this thing, uh, it's got quite a sudden, abrupt, and quite bleak ending, but uh, it says in the introduction, Then we arrive at the climax of this story, and it's sudden, shuddering halt. It's hard not to feel a little bruised, but then we must remember that Conan Doyle tipped Sherlock Holmes over the Reich and back falls, but eventually gave in to sentiment and his bank manager. And we've got a little quote to kick things off. It says, Anything that happens, happens. Anything that in happening causes something else to happen, causes something else to happen. Anything that in happening causes itself to happen again, happens again. It doesn't necessarily do it in chronological order though. The first few paragraphs here, I think I'm going to read you the first five paragraphs um, because I think they're just interesting, you know. The history of the galaxy has got a little muddled for a number of reasons. Partly because those who are trying to keep track of it have got a little muddled, but also because some very muddling things have been happening anyway. One of the problems has to do with the speed of light and the difficulties involved in trying to exceed it. You can't. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light, with the possible exception of bad news, which obeys its own special laws. The Hingafriel people of Ark and Tufel Minor did try to build spaceships that were powered by bad news, and were so extremely unwelcome whenever they arrived anywhere that there wasn't really any point in being there. So, by and large, the peoples of the galaxy tended to languish in their own local muddles, and the history of the galaxy itself was, for a long time, largely cosmological. Which is not to say that people weren't trying. They tried sending off fleets of spaceships to do battle or business in distant parts, but these usually took thousands of years to get anywhere. By the time they eventually arrived, other forms of travel had been discovered which made use of hyperspace to circumvent the speed of light, so that whatever battles it was that the slower than light fleets had been sent to fight had already been taken care of centuries earlier by the time they actually got there. This didn't, of course, deter their crews from wanting to fight the battles anyway. They were trained, they were ready, they'd had a couple of thousand years sleep, they'd come a long way to do a tough job, and by Zarkon they were going to do it. And so anyway, this sh ship gets damaged, and it's got like an automated, you know, system in place. It does have a crew, but the crew are kind of asleep. Um, and the, so the automated, like, robots and uh, computer program are trying to figure out what happened. Further investigation quickly established what it was that had happened. A meteorite had knocked a large hole in the ship. The ship had not previously detected this because the meteorite had neatly knocked out that part of the ship's processing equipment, which was supposed to detect if the ship had been hit by a meteorite. And I've never been to New York, but um, this did tickle me. One of the extraordinary things about life is the sort of places it's prepared to put up with living. Anywhere it can get some kind of a grip, whether it's the intoxicating seas of Santa Genus 5, where the fish never seem to care whatever the heck kind of direction they swim in, the firestorms of Frastra, where they say life begins at 40,000 degrees, or just burrowing around in the lower intestine of a rat for the sheer unadulterated hell of it, life will always find a way of hanging on in somewhere. Or just burrowing around in the lower intestine of a rat for the sheer unadulterated hell of it, life will always find a way of hanging on in somewhere. It will even live in New York, though it's hard to know why. In the wintertime, the temperature falls well below the legal minimum, or rather it would do if anybody had the common sense to set a legal minimum. The last time anybody made a list of the top 100 character attributes of New Yorkers, common sense snuck in at number 79. He writes, When it's fall in New York, the air smells as if someone's been frying goats in it, and if you're keen to breathe, the best plan is to open a window and stick your head in a building. Great description of one of the characters. It's actually uh, Trillion, but this kind of alternate reality, uh, reality Earth. Her hair felt as if she'd bought it at a fairground on a stick. I mean, she is in New York. And we learn about this astrologer called Gail Andrews. She was an astrologer, a famous, and if rumour were true, influential astrologer, having allegedly influenced the number of decisions made by the late President Hudson, including everything from which flavour of cream whip to have on which day of the week, to whether or not to bomb Damascus. 
it's depressingly true, isn't it? And yeah, basically another planet gets discovered and this is why it's interesting with the astrology because we get the idea of like, surely, well, surely the notion that great lumps of rock whirling in space knew something about your day that you didn't must take a bit of a knock from the fact that there was suddenly a new lump of rock out there that nobody had known about before. That must throw a few calculations out, mustn't it? And we get this great little exchange. I know that astrology isn't a science, said Gail. Of course it isn't. It's just an arbitrary set of rules like chess or tennis or what's that strange thing you British play? Uh, cricket? Self-loathing? Parliamentary democracy. The rules just kind of get there. They don't make any kind of sense except in terms of themselves. And so this is the universe in which Trissia didn't go with um, Zaphod Beeble rocks. Uh, she went to get a bag and when she got back, he'd gone. And so because of that, she'd made it a rule to never go back for a bag. Um, but she ends up going for this job interview as a newsreader uh, on like US television and we get um as she dabbed each tiny plastic cup into her eyes she reflected that if there was one thing life had taught her it was that there are times when you do not go back for your bag and other times when you do and had yet to teach her to distinguish between the two types of occasion and Eric Trisha's gardener um he reckons there's been aliens about he says they come down here land on your lawn and then buzz off again sometimes with your cat Mrs. Williams at the post office, her cat, you know, the ginger one, it got abducted by space aliens. Of course, they brought it back the next day, but it were in a very odd mood. Kept prowling around all morning and then falling asleep in the afternoon. Used to be the other way around is the point. Sleep in the morning, prowl in the afternoon. Jet lag, you see, from being in an interplanetary craft. Hmm. And we get this. Um, she thought that trying to live life according to any plan you actually work out is like trying to buy ingredients for a recipe from the supermarket. You get one of those trolleys which simply will not go in the direction you push it and end up just having to buy completely different stuff. What'd you do with it? What'd you do with the recipe? She didn't know. Anyway, that night an alien spacecraft landed on her lawn. And we get Ford Prefect coming along. He's going to the offices of the Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, but there's a bit of a carnival atmosphere. He discovered that the reason for the carnival atmosphere on Sacro Pilar Hensha was that the local people were celebrating the annual feast of the Assumption of St. Antwelm. St. Antwelm had been, during his lifetime, a great and popular king who had made a great and popular assumption. What King Antwelm had assumed was that what everybody wanted, all other things being equal, was to be happy and enjoy themselves and have the best possible time together. On his death, he had willed his entire personal fortune to financing an annual festival to remind everyone of this, with lots of good food and dancing and very silly games like Hunt the Wocket. His assumption had been such a brilliantly good one that he was made into a saint for it. Not only that, but all the people who had previously been made saints for doing things like being stoned to death in a thoroughly miserable way, or living upside down in barrels of dung, were instantly demoted and were now thought to be rather embarrassing. You know this great line, anything that thinks logically can be fooled by something else which thinks at least as logically as it does. The easiest way to fool a completely logical robot is to feed it the same stimulus sequence over and over again so it gets stuck in a loop. This was best demonstrated by the famous herring sandwich experiments conducted millennia ago. Um, so we get here. Um, a robot was programmed to believe that it liked herring sandwiches. This was actually the most difficult part of the whole experiment. Once the robot had been programmed to believe that it liked herring sandwiches, a herring sandwich was placed in front of it. Whereupon the robot thought to itself, Ah, a herring sandwich. I like herring sandwiches. It would then bend over and scoop up the herring sandwich in its herring sandwich scoop and then straighten up again. Unfortunately for the robot, it was fashioned in such a way that the action of straightening up caused the herring sandwich to slip straight back off its herring sandwich scoop and fall onto the floor in front of the robot. Whereupon the robot thought to itself, ah, a herring sandwich, etc. and repeated the same action over and over and over again. The only thing that prevented the herring sandwich from getting bored with the whole damn business and crawling off in search of other ways of passing the time was that the herring sandwich, being just a bit of dead fish between a couple of slices of bread, was marginally less alert to what was going on than was the robot. So we get our introduction to Arthur Dent here, at least uh, as far as this novel goes. Arthur Dent had been in some hell holes in his life, but he had never before seen a spaceport which had a sign saying, even travelling despondently is better than arriving here. To welcome visitors, the arrivals hall featured a picture of the president of Nawat smiling. It was the only picture anybody could find of him, and it had been taken shortly after he had shot himself, so although the photo had been retouched as well as could be managed, the smile at war was rather a ghastly one. The side of his head had been drawn back in in crayon. No replacement had been found for the photograph because no replacement had been found for the president. There was only one ambition which anyone on the planet ever had, and that was to leave. And we learned some more about it. The main town was called Old Well. There weren't any other towns to speak of. Settlement on Now What had not been a success, and the sort of people who actually wanted to live on Now What were not the sort of people you would want to spend time with. 
and uh, he reads the brochure. It talked about the early years of settlement. It said that the major activities pursued on Nawat were those of catching, skinning, and eating Nawatian bog hogs, which were the only extant form of animal life on Nawat, all others having long ago died of despair. We learn about Ford Prefect's Code of Ethics. Uh, one rule he made was never to buy his own drinks. He wasn't sure if that counted as an ethic, but you have to go with what you got. He was also firmly and utterly opposed to all and any forms of cruelty to any animals whatsoever, except geese. And furthermore, he would never steal from his employers. Well, not exactly steal. Uh, stealing is biting the hand that feeds you, sucking very hard on it, even nibbling it in an affectionate kind of way is okay, but you don't actually bite it. Not when that hand's the guide. And we get this line here, um... Uh... Laser light flickered all over him as if he was a packet of biscuits at a supermarket checkout. The heavier duty laser guns were held for the moment in reserve. The fact that all of this was happening in virtual space made no difference. Being virtually killed by a virtual laser in virtual space is just as effective as the real thing because you're as dead as you think you are. And uh, that reminded me as well, there's a, a, I think the creator of the Oculus Rift, was it? Created a version of a game where it would actually kill you in real life if you died in the game. So we learn a... Uh, Arthur's off to meet the ascetics. Um, the last village Arthur visited consisted entirely of extremely high poles. They were so high that it wasn't possible to tell from the ground what was on top of them, and Arthur had to climb three before he found one that had anything on top of it at all other than a platform covered with bird droppings. Not an easy task. You went up the poles by climbing on the short wooden pegs that had been hammered into them in slowly ascending spirals. Anybody who was a less diligent tourist than Arthur would have taken a couple of snapshots and sloped right off to the nearest bar and grill, where you also could buy a range of particularly sweet and gooey chocolate cakes to eat in front of the ascetics. But largely a result of this, most of the ascetics had gone now. In fact, they had mostly gone and set up lucrative therapy centers on some of the more affluent worlds in the northwest ripple of the galaxy, where the living was easier by a factor of about 17 million, and the chocolate was just fabulous. Most of the ascetics, it turned out, had not known about chocolate before they took up asceticism. So Ford goes into uh, like the head office of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, into the editor-in-chief's office. Um, and he finds some people there he doesn't expect. There were several of them, in fact, and all of them seemed to be more heavily armed and armoured than you normally expected corporate executives to be, even in today's rough-and-tumble business world. And um, Arthur's off in a strange world, as, as he tends to do. And we get natural, there was a tricky word. He'd long ago realised that a lot of things that he had thought of as natural, like buying people presents at Christmas, stopping at red lights, or falling at a rate of 32 feet per second per second, were just the habits of his own world, and didn't necessarily work the same way anywhere else. But not to wish, that really couldn't be natural, could it? That would be like not breathing. If you see some disturbances, it's because Biggie's here. Only Biggie. And uh, there's a, a the ship that Arthur's on crashes, and um, he survives it. We get Arthur Dent, because of the sheer boredom of endless interstellar flight, was the only one on board who had actually familiarised himself with the ship's safety procedures in case of an unscheduled landing, and was therefore the sole survivor. And we learn, uh, we learn where the title comes from, uh, the sub-editors... Uh, bastard. What about all that copy of his they'd cut? Fifteen years of research he'd filed from one planet alone and they'd cut it to two words. Mostly harmless. And that is, of course, the Earth. We get a quote that's actually quite famous. A common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. Another great little quote here, which is very true. The major difference between a thing that might go wrong and a thing that cannot possibly go wrong is that when a thing that cannot possibly go wrong goes wrong, it usually turns out to be impossible to get at or repair. And uh, the windows at the Hitchhiker's Guide, they'd been, uh, they'd been designed to be unopenable, but then they had to be modified so that you could open them. And so we get, the thing you realised about the windows was this, because they'd been converted into openable windows after they had first been designed to be impregnable, they were in fact much less secure than if they'd been designed as openable windows in the first place. We get a reference to uh, Rimplon, a new synthetic fabric which was terrific for space travel because it looked its absolute best when it was all creased and sweaty. And so uh, anyway, Trillian goes and finds Arthur and she learns, you know, this has been this, this, been this space crash and she knows. But you mean they knew where it happened, they knew I'd survived. Yes. But nobody's ever been to look or search or rescue. There's been absolutely nothing. Well, there wouldn't be. It's a whole complicated insurance thing. They just bury the whole thing, pretend it never happened. The insurance business is completely screwy now. You know, they've reintroduced the death penalty for insurance company directors. Really? said Arthur. No, I didn't. For what offence? Trillian frowned. What do you mean, offence? Very nice. So we learn about the uh, the planet that Arthur's on. The days were just a little over 25 hours long, which basically meant an extra hour in bed every single day. 
The planet orbited its single sun every 300 days, which was a good number because it meant the year didn't drag by. The moon orbited Lamuella just over nine times a year, which meant that a month was a little over 30 days, which was absolutely perfect because it gave you a little more time to get things done in. It was not merely reassuringly like Earth, it was actually rather an improvement. And so anyway, his daughter comes to stay with him on this planet, and yes, he has a daughter. And um, it's a very primitive planet, so they're kind of fascinated by the TV shows on a watch. The villagers were absolutely hypnotised by all these wonderful magic images flashing over her wrist. They had only ever seen one spaceship crash, and it had been so frightening, violent and shocking, and had caused so much horrible devastation, fire and death that, stupidly, they had never realised it was entertainment. Uh, and so the, the priest finds he has to start adding spaceship crashes to his stories, otherwise his flock gets bored. Another quote that's quite famous, It can be very dangerous to see things from somebody else's point of view without the proper training. Another great quote that is another famous one, you live and learn, at any rate, you live. And another one of the famous quotes, it's a very quotable book, very quotable author. Uh, all you really need to know for the moment is that the universe is a lot more complicated than you might think, even if you start from a position of thinking it's pretty damn complicated in the first place. The, um... Priest, he's called Old Thrashbarg. Old Thrashbarg had said on one occasion that sometimes if you received an answer, the question might be taken away. Some of the villagers had privately said that this was the only properly wise thing they'd ever heard Thrashbarg say, and after a short debate on the matter, had put it down to chance. Yeah, that's what happens. Okay, so Tricia, uh, aka Trillian, but the Trillian who stayed behind, she does end up meeting um, the people who've the aliens who are living on this newly discovered planet in our solar system and she takes a load of footage with her but it looks so fake that she can't use it even though it did actually happen but people just wouldn't believe her they'd think it was faked oh yeah and they meet Elvis uh, and actually they take his car that well they buy his car and I think this is very true of what us we humans are like the news networks don't like this kind of thing they regard it as a waste an incontrovertible spaceship arrives out of nowhere in the middle of London and it is sensational news of the highest magnitude. Another completely different one arrives three and a half hours later and somehow it isn't. Another spacecraft, said the headlines and newsstand billboards. This one's pink. A couple of months later they could have made a lot more of it. The third spacecraft, half an hour after that, the little four berth Rundy runabout, only made it onto the local news. Uh, and then the only thing I want to share with you as well is there's um, some kind of original photocopies of some of the original documents that Adams had as well. So he's, there's a, a well-trodden story that um, he had a few beers and went for a lie down in a field and looked up at the stars and that's how he came up with the idea of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and he, he says here, um, it sounds plausible, it certainly has a familiar kind of ring to it. Unfortunately, I've only got my own word for it now because the constant need to repeat the story, tell me Douglas, how did it all start, has now completely obliterated my memory of the actual event. All I can remember now is the sequence of words which makes up the story. Well, it's very interesting you should ask that, Brian. I was lying in this field, and if I ever forget that, then the whole thing will have vanished from my mind forever. If I then come across a BBC press release which says that I thought of the idea in Spain, I'll probably think it must be true. After all, they are the BBC, aren't they? However, I wouldn't like to create the impression that all a writer has to do is sit in a field, cramming himself with a couple of stellar artoises, whereupon a passing idea will instantly pounce on him, and then it's all over by the typing. An idea is only an idea. An actual script, on the other hand, is hundreds of ideas bashed around, screwed up, thrown into the bin, fished out of the bin an hour later and folded up into thick wads to stop the table wobbling, and then the same again for the next line, and then the next, and so on, until you have a whole page or the table finally keels over. The problem is, is that you can't go off and rave up in a field every time you need an idea, so you just have to sit there and think of the little bastards, and if you can't think of them, you just have to sit there. Or think of an excuse for doing something else. That's quite easy. And I just thought this was interesting too. An article from uh, November 2000, so not long before his death. There's always a moment when you start to fall out of love, whether it's with a person or an idea or a cause. Even it's one you only narrate to yourself years after the event. A tiny thing, a wrong word, a false note, which means that things can never be quite the same again. For me, it was hearing a stand-up comedian make the following observation. These scientists, eh? They're so stupid. You know those black box flight recorders they put on aeroplanes, and you know they're meant to be indestructible? It's always the thing that doesn't get smashed. So why don't they make the planes out of the same stuff? The audience roared with laughter at how stupid scientists were, couldn't think their way out of a paper bag, but I sat feeling uncomfortable. Was I just being pedantic to feel that the joke didn't really work because flight recorders are made out of titanium, and that if you made planes out of titanium rather than aluminium, they'd be far too heavy to get off the ground in the first place? I began to pick away at the joke, supposing Eric Morecambe had said it, would it be funny then? 
Well, not quite, because that would have relied on the audience seeing that Eric was being dumb. In other words, they would have had to know as a matter of common knowledge about the relative weights of titanium and aluminium. There was no way of deconstructing the joke. If you think this is obsessive behaviour, you should try living with it. That didn't rely on the teller and the audience complacently conspiring together to jeer at someone who knew more than they did. It sent a chill down my spine and still does. I felt betrayed by comedy in the same way that gangster rap now makes me feel betrayed by rock music. I also began to wonder how many of the jokes I was making were just, well, ignorant. So yes, uh, mostly harmless by Douglas Adams. As I say, uh, there are quite a few negative reviews of, of this on Goodreads. I don't think they're justified. I thought it was a fantastic read, very, um, you know, it's just one that you're going to want to read if you're a Hitchhikers fan and you haven't finished the series yet. Uh, I gave it probably a 4.5 out of 5. It was one of my favourites of the lot, I reckon. Um, and now I'm just looking at the cover and trying to imagine what my face would look like with those sunglasses on. So there we have it. That's what I made of Mostly Harmless by Douglas Adams. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.